This seems really hard to believe right now, but at the beginning of the 20th century, people saw film not as anything that could be artistic, but as some kind of technological trifle. Interesting, but not really worthy of attention. That's why the critic Rudolf Arnheim wrote his essay for the first time, arguing that, in fact, film was and could be and should be considered an art. In fact, the first new art invented in thousands of years. So it's sort of ironic that a hundred years later, Roger Ebert got himself a little bit mired in controversy with the video gaming community when he made the same kind of claim. Video games are a technological trifle, but they can never be considered works of art. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about how mu video games, and specifically music in video games, has become an art. But I want to start by comparing the two, because video game music works a lot like film music. So for ex consider, for example, how if you were a composer, you might score an Indiana Jones film. So here's the tableau. Indiana Jones walks into a temple. There's an artifact. The camera is on Indiana Jones, turns, and rests on that artifact. And you can imagine the score swelling up and reaching a climax right at that moment. Well, if you were to score the video game version, the spin-off of that movie, you would have another problem because you don't know how long it's going to take for your player to enter and get to the artifact. So how do you score that moment in exactly the right way? That's really the challenge of writing music for video games. For me, an even more intriguing question is how you could create a video game that is its own musical score. So I'm going to be looking at three examples today of video games that are their own musical score that the players can then perform. Before we do, let me tell you a few terms that we use when we talk about film music. Really important one, diegetic, and non-diegetic. These are music, essentially, that characters can hear or can't hear. So a diegetic music is music that's within this game, so the characters can hear it. Non-diegetic, they can't. So ask yourself, do the characters hear the music? And a great example of this, the beginning of Harry Potter, when the credits come up, you hear this great orchestral tune, you know the characters of the movie can't hear that. But later on in the same film, when Hagrid plays it on the flute, you know that he can hear it. So that's sort of the difference between these things. So the same things apply when you're listening to or writing video game music. You have diegetic and non-diegetic, but you have this interactive element. Can the music change as a result of the game state, or is it always going to be the same? And if it does change, how? So these terms come from Karen Collins. Uh, she wrote the first book on video game music. Uh, from an academic standpoint, and she was, in fact, our keynote speaker last week. And she divides this dynamic aspect into adaptive audio. So say, for example, you're about to run out of time in Super Mario Brothers, and you hear the music speed up. That's an adaptive change. And then there's interactive music, which has the character performing it in a way. So think Zelda the Ocarina of Time when the titular character plays the titular instrument. You, he, you press buttons on the controller, and you see the character play that instrument. I want to start with Guitar Hero just to give a sense of how these things work, and because most people have some familiarity with this game, and it also readily lends itself to discussing music in video games. So in this game, there is a musical notation. It sort of looks like guitar tablature coming at you at all times, and your job is to realize that uh, using the notation on the screen to interact with the guitar controller that you're holding, and then the game tells you, either by playing the music or playing scratchy noises, whether you've done it right or not. So I'm going to use this standpoint of a way of thinking about it. You've got some visual element that you respond to, and the game either plays the soundtrack as expected or alters it in some way. So here's the first game I'm going to talk about. This is called Bit Trip, Run Bit Trip Runner. And as you can see, it looks just like a platformer. You've got the character, Commander Video, who needs to jump up and collect this piece of gold, but kick through this crystal 
and step up over this little platform. Otherwise, he gets reset. So it looks like just a standard platformer game, but in fact, the music is incredibly important. Because, as you'll see on this transcription that I've done with the map overlaid on top of it, the obstacles that you have to negotiate get repeated as though they were kind of mo musical motives and fragments. So here in the opening, you get this motive four times in a row. And moreover, when you do it correctly, it's accompanied by a musical motive. So it's conflating the idea of the obstacle and the music. I'm going to play you an entire run-through of the level. There's a few things I want you to pay attention to. So, I want you to listen for that obstacle motive as it comes back later in the level. I want you to notice the introduction of a new motive, the springboard motive, as it get re gets repeated and then fragmented several times as the game unfolds. So, on the top, you'll have the score, and on the bottom, you'll have some footage of the gameplay. platforming game, but what we're really playing is sort of a different version of Guitar Hero. Here's a second game. This one is called Dyad, and it looks like old-school cylindrical shooters, something like Gyrus that came out in the early Atari era. You have a spaceship that's racing through a tunnel, and objects to interact with you're not really shooting them, but you're connecting them in some way. And so this really throws back to some old school kinds of games. But what's really important about this level is that each interaction you have with the elements in it is associated with some kind of musical cue. And the, the level is created randomly every time, so you'll never perform it the same way twice. You don't have to memorize any of the, uh, the things that I have up here, uh, but what you should know about this level is that over time, you run out of life energy, and you have to interact with things to come back up to life, but you will always run out of memory uh, energy. So as this approaches, there's this uh, motive, this really obtrusive motive in a weird meter, which is really dissonant with the overall A minor, and you're going to hear this, you won't miss it. And this intrudes on your consciousness, makes it hard to concentrate, makes it kind of hard to play. So here is footage from the beginning of this level and the end. And notice how as you get closer to death, the music gets worse and worse and more uh, uh, dissonant and cacophonous. And imagine trying to keep up with the gameplay tasks that are demanded you while this happens. <laughs>
It's possible. You could think of each level as though it were a musical score with elements that you interact with that as you play the game, you actually realize in a way. And you create this musical composition. And it would be possible, I guess, to do a transcription of the level, just like I did with the other game. And here you see uh, something I made up. This is not a transcription of the level, but it's like I pretended it would be. And it was really hard. So I didn't want to do any more than this one page. Um, but anyway, at the end, the, it was pointless because the whole point of this level is that the music is going to change every time you do it. So to inscribe one particular playthrough defeats the purpose of the music as it's being created. OK, well, now for something a little bit different. I've looked at two games which claim to be music games, Bit Trip, it has Beat it, and Bit Trip Runner. These are, are games with the sounds in them. Dyad is going out of its way to, be, to reinvent the music game. Here's a game called L.A. Noir. This is a uh, kind of a film noir detective story set in 1940s Los Angeles, where the main character is uh, investigating crimes and interrogating witnesses. So you'd think this, this has nothing to do with the other kinds of games that we've looked at until you get to these interrogation sequences. During these sequences, you ask your suspect a series of questions based on the clues that you've picked up in the investigation sites. And then you have to determine, are they telling the truth? Do you have evidence to demonstrate that they're actually lying? Or are you just going to suspect that they're not telling everything that they know? And so you take this guess, and the game tells you whether you're right or wrong. On the upper left is a piano cue that sounds if you guess correctly. And on the upper right is a, is a cue with some strings that sounds if you guess incorrectly. And the important thing here is that the first two notes are exactly the same. And the player has to wait for that third note. It really raises the anxiety and the tension because you need to wait for the third note to know whether you made the right mis uh, choice or not. So what I've done here is I've stripped out all of the speech and just put together the, the music that would happen in the interrogation sequence. So here is a sample interrogation soundtrack. Uh, you're going to be in the investigation site. You'll hear this kind of investigation jazz. And the minute the interrogation begins, it segues into this C-sharp major triad, which acts as a drone the whole way through. So what you realize is the game actually becomes another musical score. You have to perform the correct piece by making the correct selections. So I've transcribed this, and it kind of looks like this. If you choose correctly, you get to choose the bottom set of systems. And if you choose incorrectly, you make the upper set of systems. And the idea here is that the perfect playthrough sounds like the bottom track, and an imperfect playthrough, much like the screeching of the guitar in Guitar Hero, would then follow one of these upper pads. So what to me is really interesting is the way that Dyad actually departs from the video game music model 
that is established in Guitar Hero and, and uh, follows through in Runner and even actually kind of works in L.A. Noir. You can think about L.A. Noir in the same way you could think about playing the guitar. But then Dyad, which looks and sounds and appears to be much more musically oriented than uh, uh, less, uh, no, so diet is more than L.A. Noir, is actually less like that in this particular model. So I guess what I want to say is, yes, video games are art, video games can be art, video games will be art, and in 100 years, this audience at TEDx Youngstown 2114 will be as surprised to learn that critics at the beginning of the 21st century could have ever thought they weren't. Thank you so much.